uh, the judge would neglect to place any restrictions on that. So at a minimum, I would ask that you restrict her to her movements within the state of Connecticut. She not be able to leave the state of Connecticut uh, unless or approved by the court. Uh, secondly, I'd actually ask that she um, be kept within 10 or 15 miles, whatever the court believes is reasonable, uh, of her residence, uh, wherever that may be. That has not yet been established, so there's no objection to the statewide restriction, Your Honor. All right, ma'am. In addition to the conditions previously imposed, the court is going to order you not to leave the state of Connecticut without the express prior approval of the court. I spoke briefly, counsel and chambers. We have agreed upon a future date. Yes, Your Honor. July 18. Counsel, are you pleased that I got it? Yes. Uh, Your Honor, we entered not guilty pleas and elect trial by jury. So no, we not guilty jury election July 18th for further proceedings. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next matter, Your Honor, is uh, Fotis Dulos, line one on the regular docket. <coughs> have a moment with counsel. Pettis on behalf of Mr. Dulo. Kevin Smith on behalf of Mr. Dulo. And Judge, we have Rich Rockland here who is assisting on bond re related issues. And with your permission, Patrick Nugent, a young intern, will stand before the bar and get his feet wet at the law. Good morning, counsel. Good morning, sir. Yes. First time here, Your Honor. Uh, my understanding is counsel wants to address uh, the conditions of release set by Judge McLaughlin when he was arraigned. We do what we would like to address bond, um, Judge. Certainly, there has been enormous public interest in this case. And as near as I can tell, based on the number of reporters present, comments that we've received since we appeared in this case over the weekend, Mr. Ulos has been tried and convicted in the court of, a public, a court of public opinion for a crime that he's not yet been charged with. And candidly, I have doubts can, can be brought and can withstand a probable cause inquiry. Indeed, from my perspective, it's somewhat surprising he's here at all. Um, what we know is that Jennifer went missing sometime in the early morning of the 24th um, and was reported missing by late day. We've been able to account for Mr. Dulos's whereabouts with independent evidence for almost all of that time, including an early morning meeting at his home with an attorney. Um, he received a call from Greece, which uh, we don't yet have verified phone records, but we know who the person is and have spoken to them. Um, we believe that Mr. Connors was in and out of the house with him um, from a period roughly from about 9.30 until about 1 p.m. when he next reliably surfaces in the search warrant at 1.33. So he's up in Farmington for some period of three to four hours, which on the state's theory, I, apparently, or the public's theory, would have given time to drive down, commit a vicious crime, dispose of the body, get rid of a car, and drive back up to Farmington. It's possible, I suppose, as a matter of mathematics, but as a matter of experience, it's a ludicrous suggestion. What we believe and what we are troubled by is the fact that in this, the warrant for this arrest, and this is certainly one of the factors that you can and should consider in adjusting bond, is the strength of the state's case. Search the warrant, and what you'll learn is the state can make accounts for my client's whereabouts after 1.33 that afternoon, but although it has the electronic means to do so, it refuses to produce any evidence about where he was previously. We're going to be seeking through the FBI cell site records that will show that he was that his devices were used from his home that morning. There's no evidence uh, that he was at the home that we are aware of. Um, and if there's no evidence that he was at the home, it's hard for me to understand where we get the scienter or the guilty knowledge that would serve as a necessary element of hindering prosecution or tampering with physical evidence. I'm aware of press reports that there are videos showing him stopping a car 30 times on Albany Avenue, and some of the wilder speculation has had him toss 30 bags, and this has fueled public speculation that there's a dismembered body perhaps in a dump. Officers have spent the better part of a week in a dump with, with dogs and have found precisely nothing as near as I can tell. We don't know 
where Jennifer is. We don't think the state knows where Jennifer is. We think that this, this, love, this bond and these arrests were an attempt to pit the two of them, Mr. Conus and Mr. Dulos, against one another in a classic prisoner's dilemma that was designed to give the first person to speak a get out of jail free card on charges that are flimsy at the outset uh, for information about the body. Almost a week after Michelle first went to the police, there still is no body and there still is no confirmation that Jennifer, Jennifer is in fact dead. There is a contested family matter and what was learned in that Mr. Dulos would have had no motive. The custody battle was turning in his way. The court had made adverse findings about his ex, soon to be ex-wife. The court, and among those, ex, uh, among those findings were conclusions about her stability and her mental health that we will not put on the record at this time, but simply say that we are aware of those. Um, and it is an open question in our mind where she is. But perhaps the most troubling thing of all is we believe the state has illegally seized and illegally possesses evidence that is necessary to the defense. Mr. Fotis appeared at a local police department in New Canaan on the 25th, and an officer asked for his telephone. He was accompanied by counsel at that point, a, 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 a lawyer named Yakov, I'm not sure I'm going to pronounce it correctly, Petranker. Um, when the officer took the phone and Petranker asked why he wanted it, um, the officer wouldn't say. And we've got an affidavit from Petranker that when he asked for the phone back, the officer refused and said, you're not going to get it back. That's not a seizure, that's a theft. And we want the phone back. So from our perspective, there are real and substantial questions about the, strengths of the st of strength of the state's case. Obviously, there's enormous public interest in the case. My client is an established businessman. The press has combed through his financial affairs to report that he's got some difficulties financially. He's in real estate. That happens. Mark the markets come and go. We can make a modest bond. Uh, but we were asking for the court to reduce that bond on the theory that he is not a flight risk. As your officer, I will take possession of any and all passports and not direct them, um, um, uh, return them to anyone uh, without your express permission. If necessary, I'll deposit them in the, courts, in, the court, uh, in, in the court clerk's office for you. But we're asking for a bond of $100,000. He is not a flight risk. There is no evidence that he is, although, although there is enormous speculation. I mean, you, got, you don't have to look any further than, than this courtroom right now. I mean, I suspect if you did a straw poll of these journalists, and I'm, I'm walking into court, where's the body? Where's the body? There is no body that we're aware of, and I'm sick and tired of hearing about it. My client is entitled to the presumption of innocence. We want to cash that commitment that our republic affords people in today, and we want him with us to prepare a defense, um, because in part, we have got three or, uh, two or three hours of time where we think the digital record will confirm us. We don't have access to Michelle right now. Her lawyer won't speak to me about what she said to Mr. Colangelo. I doubt Mr. Colangelo will share what she said to them under the law enforcement privilege. So how long is my client going to sit in a jail cell, unable to assist in his defense on the basis of speculation banned in large part by hysteria? We want him at our side as we prepare a defense. As yet, there is no charge of murder. I doubt there can be one based on the evidence that I'm aware of. There may never be one. Um, we would, we were asking for a bond of $100,000. Uh, Carter, counsel highlighted a lot of the, the warrant that brought his client here. Uh, the one paragraph he didn't hit on, and I wonder why, is that you know, we found Jennifer's blood on the items that the defendant was depositing in those cans confirmed by DNA by the state lab. Um, I'm actually glad counsel brought up the bond today, Your Honor, because I was going to ask that you increase his bond based on new information. And as you know, this is a fluid investigation. Um, the state police and New Canaan police are working on this 24-7, and they have been since the day that Jennifer disappeared. Um, a new bit of information that I received, Your Honor, that I would ask you to increase the defendant's bond is that we are able to, um, the lab was able to confirm that the defendant's DNA was found in a mixture on the faucet inside of Jennifer's kitchen, in the house where she uh, went missing from. So mixture, defendant's DNA, victim's blood, on the faucet in her kitchen. He was present at the home with his children for dinner days earlier. It's hardly surprising that there'd be trace DNA. Did you, I don't want to interrupt counsel anything through. I wasn't, but if you want to speak, no, I'll stop. Fine. I'd rather address the court and we'll take it that way. So what else was Thank you. 
Um, counsel is right, Your Honor. There was, he was there the Wednesday before she went missing in the backyard, never in the, the kitchen area or not inside the house. Uh, we have several witnesses that indicate that he told them that, that he was never inside the house, that he was actually worried about his DNA possibly being in there because a hair could have fallen off on one of the children. So those are comments that he made to people that we actually um, interviewed in this investigation. So DNA in the mixture with her blood on his, in, in, the, in her kitchen, um, I would ask that you increase the bond to $850,000. Thank you. Judge, here's the difficulty in the case, the impossible difficulty. You're aware of the corpus delecti. You're aware of the corpus delecti rule, and you're aware of statements against penal interest and their limited use in a case of a nobody potential believed and suspected homicide. It's one thing. I, I don't know who these people are that Mr. Colangelo spoke to. I hope it's not the children. I certainly am not going to be able to get access to them. Um, I don't know who he said he was worried about a, a hair being in the house. Too. These things are not admissible statements. Um, but even if he said it, um, when, who is the first suspect any time a, 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 a spouse is murdered when there's a contested custody going on? The police always look at the spouse. So that's where it would begin, and anybody who wouldn't worry about it when they were at the, at the home and one, you know, uh, would, would obviously have that concern. We think that bond is being used in this case not to secure the safety of the community or to assure the presence of Mr. Dulo at trial, but as an investigative device. And that's the very thing this republic was founded on, and that's why we have a Bill of Rights. The state has overreached in this case, and they can put all the pressure they want on Mr. Dulos. When he enters that not guilty plea in a few moments, it'll be because he is not guilty. I want him at my side to prepare this defense because he's defending himself now, apparently, not just against the state of Connecticut, but against every reporter with two nickels and the time to come into this courthouse and pay for the gas to get here. And that's just wrong. Well, I respect the presumption of innocence. It's also undisputed that persons accused of crimes have a constitutional right to bail, and the determination of what constitutes an appropriate pretrial bond is within the sound discretion of the court. And the statute, which is 5464A, requires me to look at certain factors when setting both financial and non-financial conditions of release. And I have to consider not only the nature and circumstances of the crime, but what conditions will reasonably assure the defendant's future appearance we must also ensure that the safety of another person will not be endangered by the defendant's release from custody. The court did set the bond on the warrant at $500,000 with certain non-financial conditions. So the record should show the defendant is not being denied bail, but rather he may be unable to post the bail that the court set. So respectfully, that's not the same thing. The defendant, having been charged with certain crimes, is afforded the opportunity for release pending trial that's required under our Constitution. Although counsel argues the amount of bail is excessive, it's well established that a reasonable bail is not necessarily an amount that the defendant has within his financial means to raise, but rather it's an amount that is reasonable under all of the circumstances. So while it's true the defendant has no prior record, in light of the serious allegations in the warrant and the, the safety of Jennifer Dulos, the, the court was, is going to deny the state's motion to increase the bond but I also am going to deny the defense motion to lower that bond. So the bond will remain as set. If there are further charges brought in this case, we'll address the bond at that time. But this, the court is going to take this in increments. And that is the ruling of the court. On that incremental ruling, Judge, yeah. may I be heard? Um, with re my understanding, and I wasn't here last time, and I'm sure I'll be corrected if I'm wrong, is that it was to be posted bond at the court only? Am I correct about well, that? He'd have to be fitted with a GPS bracelet, not leave the state of Connecticut without permission, surrender his passport to the custody of the clerk of the court. We are prepared to make bond today, and I am asking you to issue the following order, um, that Kevin Smith and I take possession of a 401k held for Mr. Dulos's benefit from a company called Fidelity, and that we take possession of that as security that our bondsman has asked us to ask, ask this of the court, and that it not be released um, with, except to any person, Mr. Dulos or any person, without an order of the court. The reason for the request is as follows. There is a sum sufficient on its face to serve as security for the bond in the IRA. If Mr. Dulos is exonerated, there's no point in incurring the tax and early withdrawal penalties. He's younger than I am. He's younger than 59. Um, if the, he absconds, there will be a, a, a sum and there will be tax consequences and penalties. And our bondsman is prepared to take the cash we have to tender and that 
instrument as security for the bond. So we're asking you to issue the following order, that any IRA or, for, or any 401k held on Mr. Dulop's behalf by Fidelity um, be um, given um, to Mr. Smith and I to hold as officers of the court and that the proceeds of that are not to be disturbed, touched, moved, or in any way directed to anyone else without further direction or order of the court with notice to the state before any intention to do so. Counsel? I don't know anything about the IRA, Your Honor. I don't know how much is there. It's um, a very unusual <coughs> request. The court normally, when it sets bonds, leaves the amount of surety, whether it's real estate, financial, or other promissory notes. I don't normally get into that level of detail that you're asking me to do. I know, okay. and, and, but we want to provide the state with assurances, A, that they've got the wrong guy, and he's going to be here, um, and B, um, we want to provide you with assurances, that we, and, and our bondsmen with assurances, that in the event that there is an adverse consequence, the bondsman's and in state's interests are protected. If you don't want to issue that order, that's fine, we'll deal with the bondsman, but he asked me to make the request. I, I understand why he's making the request, but the court declines the opportunity. I don't want to set a precedent where we micromanage a defendant's finances to post bonds. So the bond is 500,000 cash assurity with the non-financial conditions. The defendant, if he has the means and he has a bond available, may post that bond from the courthouse here today as long as he's fit with the bracelet and is prepared to surrender his passports and also don't leave the state of Connecticut without the express prior permission of the court. So do you understand those conditions, sir? I do. Okay, thank you. But I want to make sure you're on passports. I don't know if he has more than one. I want to make sure that we're getting all of the... Uh, I will take possession of any passports and, with, and we'll... Well, you want, to, you want to turn it over to the clerk. You want to know the clerk? Would you please? Yes, yeah. I have no problem with you acting as the intermediary. Okay. And Judge, one final issue. You received court communication from prior counsel dated on or about June 7th. Yes. Uh, relating to uh, staleness of potential search warrants. Um, it's my understanding from Mr. Colangelo that while those warrants are now stale, they are no longer being acted upon, and if there's going to be subsequent searches, there'll be new warrants? That's correct, Your Honor. Thank no. you. Thank you, sir. Very good. All right, by agreement with counsel, this matter is continued for further proceedings to August 2nd, 2019. Oh, yeah, judge, not guilty and jury election. So noted. And I know there are speedy trial requirements in the court, but is there any chance we can bring this case to trial next month? We're ready. Well, I, did, I thought you needed some significant discovery before that. I'll get it beforehand, but Mr. Dulos is tired of sitting back and hearing people pick apart his motives. We're ready for trial. Well, I'm, I'm not going to grant a an oral motion for speedy trial under these circumstances because, as you well know, he's not statutorily entitled to it yet. But if, if he is eligible, I, I'm sure the court will accommodate that request. Our argument would be as follows, that um, justice is always tempered with equity, and under certain extraordinary circumstances, his remaining behind bars will undermine the presumption of innocence in any jury pool, and, and we don't want to do a change of venue. We're prepared to try it here, but we're concerned that as this event cascades and more and more people become interested, he'll lose the right to a fair trial. So we will file something asking for an August trial date. No, no. Well, this court stands adjourned.